Megan, as always, you remain thoughtless and unhelpful. This outing was something my son and I were eagerly anticipating, and you, having no role in its organization, are unwelcome here. My mother-in-law begins to berate me the moment my husband walks away from the table. We were on an overseas vacation that my husband had asked me to arrange. Given her attitude, I figured I might as well head home. What they discuss after I leave is of no concern to me. I am Megan, a married woman employed at a company where I have the flexibility to work predominantly from home. This means I spend considerable time at our house. My husband, Frank, is always eager to impress others and acts as though he's superior. He enjoys spending lavishly, yet never contributes to our household expenses. This aspect of his character wasn't apparent during our dating phase, but it became glaringly obvious once we started living together. His mother is his biggest fan, always singing his praises. I knew she would adore her son, as many mothers do, but she is rigid and dismissive of other opinions, including her husband's. Convinced her son can do no wrong, she takes an immediate dislike to me, offering snide remarks at every interaction. Her main gripe seems to be my financial independence, as I rely solely on my income. She frequently pressures me, suggesting, You're still young. You should work outside. Despite my explanation that I indeed work from home, she dismisses my job as a trivial part-time task suspecting I'm merely feigning work while actually playing games or neglecting my household duties. My husband is aware of my actual work commitments, but his mother continues to view me as a negligent wife. Despite his mother's frequent criticisms and misunderstandings about my work-from-home arrangement, my husband has never taken the initiative to correct her. Whenever she brings it up in his presence, he simply ignores it. I've asked him several times to clarify the situation to her, but he prefers that we sort it out ourselves, leaving me to handle the issues alone. He's even told me outright that he doesn't want to get involved in our disputes. On one occasion, when I pressed him for support, he responded by throwing divorce papers at me. It was painful to be dismissed in such a way, and it made me contemplate divorce. However, considering how challenging marriage has been, the thought of navigating a divorce seemed even more daunting. I've come to realize that my husband consistently prioritizes his mother over our relationship, which is incredibly frustrating. Yet, I know I need to find a way to manage her expectations and comments without escalating the situation further. I didn't agree to a divorce, not because my feelings for him hadn't changed, but rather because it seemed more practical to stay. He seems to think I'm still deeply in love with him, which fuels his arrogant behavior, a trait that's endearing in children, but off-putting in adults. Over time, I've learned to ignore his conceit and overlook his actions. Another reason I hesitated to pursue divorce is due to our living situation. Because of my husband's job, we live far from my in-laws, only seeing them once or twice a year. I thought I could manage this limited interaction. Additionally, since I work with international clients, American holidays don't significantly impact my schedule, allowing me some flexibility. As for my husband, despite having the opportunity, he rarely takes long breaks from work, making it uncommon for us to have extended time off together. This, coupled with our sporadic visits to see my in-laws, made me believe I could handle the situation despite the challenges it posed. After his first day back at work, my husband burst through the door, excitedly proposing an impromptu trip abroad. He explained that his co-workers had taken a seven-day holiday for an international getaway, and he felt left out. Proud of his sudden inspiration, he seemed oblivious to the impracticality of it all, which left me quite astonished at his naivete. Although I hadn't traveled this year, I suggested a domestic trip instead, considering he had never been overseas and would need to obtain a passport. I'm quite adept with languages, 
having studied abroad and traveled extensively before marriage. In addition to English, I'm fluent in Spanish and have a basic grasp of Chinese. When my mother got hooked on Korean dramas, I even picked up some Korean, though I'm not very confident in it. Despite my linguistic skills, obtaining passports and planning an international trip isn't as straightforward as my husband imagined. I proposed we plan for a trip abroad during a more convenient season, like summer or winter, but he was adamant. Without any prior experience, he chose the destination, took time off without clearing it with his workplace, and expected me to sort out all the details. He dismissed my concerns about the complexities of travel by asserting that English is universal and that we wouldn't face any issues just by ourselves. Just when I thought we might manage, he dropped another bombshell. His plan included bringing his mother along, assuming I would handle everything. Managing two inexperienced travelers seemed daunting, and his casual remark about showing some respect for your elders and earning brownie points as a devoted wife felt both patronizing and overwhelming. Despite feeling like this was more of a burden than a favor, I found myself quietly making the necessary reservations as he had directed. My husband seemed to think he was doing me a favor by orchestrating this trip, making it difficult to argue without seeming unappreciative. So as he wished, I began to organize our travel plans. I devised a comprehensive plan to manage everything, from securing passports for my mother-in-law and husband to arranging our flights and accommodations. It required a considerable amount of effort, but I methodically fulfilled all my husband's requests and meticulously crafted a flawless travel pull. Itinerary. On the day of our departure, my mother-in-law, unaware of the effort I had put in, joyfully anticipated luxury seating, praising my husband for what she assumed was his handiwork in arranging such a splendid trip. Meanwhile, my husband seemed to revel in taking credit for the entire planning process, despite the fact that I had done all the legwork. At the airport, both he and his mother were blissfully ignorant about navigating the terminals and spent their time wandering independently while I managed all the logistical details. They were clueless even when it was time to board, and in the rush to locate them, Airport staff offered to announce our boarding gate to help. Their disorganization and lack of appreciation were both frustrating and embarrassing. They even accused me of planning to enjoy the flight by myself, although they spent the duration quietly pestering the flight attendants with repeated requests. Upon reaching our destination, I hoped for some reprieve at the hotel after the ordeal of immigration, but my husband suddenly fell ill claiming he needed the bathroom urgently and leaving me with his belongings. It was puzzling since we had shared the same meal. Perhaps it was a bit of karma for his earlier behavior on the flight, where he had been flirting with a flight attendant. To make matters worse, as I juggled our luggage and his sudden departure to the restroom, my mother-in-law began to chastise me. She accused me of being the thoughtless daughter-in-law claiming that the trip was intended as a special getaway just for her and her son, and insinuated that I was merely tagging along for a free ride. She even belittled my work, suggesting that I didn't truly contribute financially. Her words stung, especially considering the extensive effort I had invested in ensuring the trip went smoothly for both of them. It was quite audacious of my mother-in-law to suggest I couldn't enjoy the trip since I hadn't contributed to its planning. To this, she retorted that she wasn't sure if she could enjoy herself with me around. Okay then, I'll leave, I concluded. With that, I handed my husband's suitcase back to her, kept my smaller bag, and walked away without looking back. Her surprised expression was almost comical. After all, she had just told me to leave. I struggled to contain my laughter. As for my husband, he was frequently running to the bathroom, so our paths didn't cross much, which was fortunate. I had already secured a ticket back to the USA, 
having anticipated the possibility of needing to return alone. While I wouldn't have minded being a guide if we were amicable, the stress and lack of appreciation made it an unwelcome task. As I left, I couldn't help but wonder how they would manage without me. They spoke only English, and although translation apps are available, I doubted my husband, who enjoys boasting about his self-sufficiency, would resort to using one. After a few straightforward side trips, I made my way to a luxurious hotel in Montreal where my parents were staying. Frank had always emphasized the importance of respecting my parents, so I decided to treat them to a lavish vacation, a stark contrast to the trip I had just abandoned. They were pleasantly surprised to see me arrive earlier than expected. Upon hearing what had transpired, they were in disbelief at the situation I had been put in. Meanwhile, my phone was inundated with calls and messages from Frank, but I chose to ignore them. I turned off my phone and savored the time with my parents. Our celebration was peaceful and joyful, uninterrupted by the chaos I had left behind. After returning home from this much-needed family time, I received a call from the embassy. It turned out that after Frank returned from the bathroom and couldn't find me, he became infuriated. Unable to reach me, he had no choice but to proceed to the hotel by himself. Likely still bewildered and angry about my sudden departure, Frank found himself utterly lost after I left. He didn't even know where the hotel was. In his confusion, a seemingly helpful local who spoke broken English offered to guide him and my mother-in-law to their destination. Unfortunately, their trust was misplaced, as they were instead robbed of their money, passports, and valuables. When the police eventually found Frank disoriented on the street, they took him to the embassy for assistance. At the embassy, they managed to contact me, asking me to come and retrieve him. Frank was in a bind without access to money, as his wallet containing his bank cards had been stolen. However, I couldn't understand why I, practically a stranger now, should be the one to rescue him. I informed him that I had already processed the divorce using the papers he once threw at me. Initially, I hadn't gone through with the divorce, thinking it would be too cumbersome, but by then I had reached my limit. I had already filled out the divorce papers upon returning to the States, and to my surprise, the proceedings went through smoothly. I had also secured a new place and signed the lease while planning my trip, wanting a fresh start. I decided against keeping the furniture we shared. It felt uncomfortable, so I planned to furnish my new apartment from scratch. I packed only my work tools and favorite clothes planning to have everything else delivered later. The embassy staff concluded their assistance, and we ended our conversation. It seems that eventually, my ex-mother-in-law and ex-husband managed to arrange for their return to the States. When Frank finally contacted me, furious, he accused me of leaving and divorcing him without notice, of abandoning him. I responded calmly, reminding him that I was merely following his mother's directive to leave. If he had any complaints, he should discuss them with her and not forget the business class flight I had arranged for his return. It was my parting gesture, a final gift. I reminded Frank that he was the one who first brought up the idea of divorce. I merely completed the paperwork he had prepared, following through on what he seemed to want. Do you think making excuses will change anything? How much more do you want to embarrass me? He asked. To which I retorted, embarrassed? If you're looking for embarrassment, I have an even juicier story. Did you know you're well known at a local strip club? You've been splurging on a favorite dancer rather than contributing to our household expenses. And when her demands became too steep, you ended up in debt. I had discovered a debt collection letter addressed to Frank at our house and hired an investigation agency to look into it. It turned out that despite his lavish spending, his obsession drove the dancer to push him away. She hoped that escalating her demands for money. 
Gifts and gestures meant to keep Frank from returning to the dancer only seemed to worsen the situation. I can only imagine how humiliating it must have been for Frank to find out that she wanted him to stay away. I warned him, if you cause any more trouble or contact me again, I'll have no choice but to inform your company about your escapades. Being rejected by the dancer you admire would certainly be a blow to your ego. Confronted with this, Frank, who had been aggressive up until then, simply responded in a subdued voice, okay, and hung up. A few days later, my ex-father-in-law reached out to me. I found it odd since we were no longer family, but he felt compelled to share some revelations about my ex-mother-in-law's true character. He had grown suspicious of her spending habits and discovered that she had depleted his retirement savings on beauty treatments and cosmetic procedures. I was clueless about these details, not being familiar with such things. When he sought my opinion, I couldn't offer much insight since I hadn't noticed any visible changes in her appearance. Perhaps the infrequency of our meetings made the transformations less noticeable. I even asked him, are you certain the money was used for beauty treatments? She spent a lot, but I don't see any visible changes. We mused that maybe they were minor enhancements only noticeable to her, but it all seemed like a frivolous waste of money. With nothing left, my ex-mother-in-law naturally turned to Frank for financial support. However, since our divorce, Frank's financial situation had spiraled downwards. He was now swamped with debt, and had even lost his apartment due to unpaid rent. He and his mother were now living in a rundown apartment. Despite these troubling circumstances, his mother refused to work and continued her spending on beauty treatments. Frank was left juggling his debts while covering both their living expenses, working relentlessly to make ends meet. It seems that even as their living conditions worsened, maintaining appearances remained their priority. Ironically, from what I've heard, the quality of the beauty treatments she indulged in had declined, and she now appeared much older. As for myself, I relish the peace and freedom that come with focusing on my work without anyone else's oversight. It's a refreshing reminder of the importance of living within one's means.